The Master Keys series of mechanical keyboards from Cooler Master features genuine Cherry MX switches and the flexibility of choice. Whether you want small, medium, or large, you can pick your size and pick your color with RGB and clear white LED backlighting options. Click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is going to be a little rough around the edges. I'm gonna say that right out of the gate because uh, I have this system back behind me. I just built it. You guys seemed to really enjoy that video. So thanks to all you guys who did watch it and I'll link it in the description if you didn't check it out. But I promised two follow-up videos on this build. This is follow-up video number one. I'm gonna be doing basic initial setup of this build since there's extra hardware and extra stuff going on in there that I need to spend a little bit of extra time making sure it works properly. I'm gonna do some initial testing, hopefully, and then I'm gonna kinda of go as far as I can today because I'm actually leaving tomorrow for Computex, so I gotta cut this off at some point. Uh, but we'll see how far I can get, and for starters, uh, let's just kinda of do a once-over of the build, all finished and put together. Here's the build, though, all put together, or rather, all put together, and then immediately started to be disassembled again, uh, because whenever I'm setting up a higher-end system, or at least a system that has extra stuff on it, like a bunch of capture cards such as these, I actually tend to pull as much of it out as possible for doing the initial setup, and that's just to make sure compatibility is correct and everything. And actually, when I first uh, plugged the system in last night, I was getting no video out out of the video card, and I had to do a couple things. Uh, I tried a BIOS reset, I tried reseeding some things. Uh, eventually, I pulled these capture cards out because I thought it might have been recognizing uh, the output capture card as, as like a video out and doing that instead of the video card, but eventually a BIOS reset and a BIOS update uh, managed managed to fix it. So um, things are, are good to go now. Windows is installed. Uh, also, quite a few people, of course, mentioned uh, in the build video that I ended up uh, installing my NHD15 vertically, as you can see here. The fans are in pull, so they're pushing air up towards the top of the case, and then it should be able to exhaust out these uh, side ventilations or out the vents that are on the top of the Dark Base 900 case here. The reason I chose to do that was simply due to compatibility. If I had rotated this 90 degrees so that the fans were vertical and pushing air that way, it was actually conflicting with the top of the graphics card. Uh, now the graphics card fortunately is installed in there and it is in the top slots uh, where it should be. So everything is fitting. And since the graphics card heat mainly is gonna be being pushed out through the side ventilation areas here, I'm not really too worried about it contaminating uh, this actual cooler up here and making it warmer, that kind of thing. Overall though, I think everything's gonna be just fine. Initial temperatures seem totally reasonable. Uh, everything is like around 30 degrees Celsius in the BIOS, so that's cool. I uh, also wanted to point out uh, all of my add-on drives here because of course I got quite a few of them. And if all goes according to plan, my PCI Express Lane configuration from the CPU going over to the add-on cards and the GPU and the capture cards is gonna be something like this. By eight or by 16 connection for the graphics card, probably by eight. The three available slots down here will be PCI Express Gen 3 by four, or I believe one of them is Gen 2 by four, but even Gen 2 by four still has plenty of bandwidth for my capture cards. Uh, and then of course we have our, uh, our, our storage devices here. So each of the uh, 750 series SSDs will be connected to a U.2. One's already plugged in down here at the bottom. And then you guys might, well, I don't know, you'd have to be pretty astute to have noticed that actually one of those 750 series SSDs wasn't plugged in in the build video. That was pretty much because I realized that the cable it came with uh, was not a U.2 cable. This has a U.2 plug on this end. The cable it came with out of the box uh, actually has like a weird M.2 on there. So it's made to plug in one side to the 750 series SSD. The other side is meant to plug into an M.2 like the port that uh, the 960 Pro is plugged into up there. But of course I don't have any more M.2 slots on this motherboard unless I were to add in PCI Express M.2 cards, which I have, but then I wouldn't have enough room for my, my capture cards, you see, because I have capture card in, capture card out, and then that third a capture card that I will be moving over from my existing capture uh, system, which is right over there. Okay, moving around here to the back though, you will see a somewhat poorly lit view of my somewhat poorly done cable management right now. And again, uh, before I set up Windows to install on the M.2 Samsung 960 Pro up there, I basically unplugged all of these drives right here. Now these are the two 750s and they have the special connectors on the back that go over to the U.2 ports. Two drives below it, of course, are the WD-RED drives. Those are just gonna connect via standard SATA. 
SATA's will, the SATA plugs will go over to the motherboard over here. They're actually already plugged in and just kind of hanging off of there. But I have a thing about when I install Windows. I like to have any other drives connected to the system, or, or, or any other drives that will be part of the system disconnected when I install Windows onto that single drive. That's just a, an old habit that goes back to the Windows 7 days, but I, I still do that. Um, whether or not it, it actually does any, any good for me. Once the system's set up properly and good to go though, and I've done some initial testing with the NVMe drives, and that drive is when I will plug in this and set up the RAID configuration. For the time being though, I did make sure before I got Windows installed to set the SATA controller in the BIOS to RAID mode. That way when I am ready to set these drives up in RAID, it'll already be in the right mode and I won't deal with any issues with booting, which shouldn't be an issue anyway because the operating systems on that M.2 drive and that shouldn't be affected by the SATA RAID uh, controller at all. Finally, since X99 doesn't have a hardware controller function for NVMe drives setting up RAID, these two drives are going to need to be set up with the software RAID uh, and that will be done from within Windows. And transition. Okay, so yesterday I sort of got a little frustrated with this system because it's a little bit more complex than most systems and it was giving me some initial issues. As mentioned, video out wasn't happening at, happening at first. I had to do a BIOS update. I had to I had to clear everything a couple times. Finally got everything working as far as the video out, got Windows installed. Good to go for the most part. So after that, my next step beyond installing drivers and everything was going to definitely be getting that RAID array set up. I'm not worried about the uh, mechanical hard drive RAID array yet. That I will be doing in the from the pre-boot environment since I have already set the uh, controller for those drives to RAID. And again, I'm gonna worry about that later. Those, those aren't really mission critical for now. What I do wanna get set up is that NVMe SSD RAID array with my two Intel 750 uh, series SSDs. They're 400 gigs each. In RAID 0, it combines the capacity, so you get 800 gigs, and it should be faster. Although the problem is, with X99, I actually don't have a hardware RAID controller. The hardware RAID controller uh, on the chipset for X99 will only work for controlling SATA drives. So for the NVMe drives, I have to use a software configuration. And there I ran into, again, just a bit of a, a frustration because for some reason, since I haven't done this with the software RAID before, I was trying to do Intel uh, R Rapid Storage Technology, IRST, as the drivers are often called when you're looking them up on your manufacturer's uh, webpage for your motherboard. However, what I actually wanted was RSTE, Rapid Storage Technology Enterprise. Once I stopped looking for IRST and started looking for RSTE, I found the correct software, I was able to get it loaded up, and in the Rapid Storage Technology Enterprise uh, interface, it's actually fairly easy. As long as your drives are connected, it should recognize them. They show up, you simply click Create Volume, and then you go through the configuration to create the volume how you want it. Since I want to RAID 0, I chose the Optimized Disk Performance Radio button there, and then I just went through with the basic setup configuration as was recommended by the software, and then my RAID array was set up course, after an initial format. Of course, I did have to go into a Windows Disk Management. Uh, I had to initialize the drive and create a new volume on there. Uh, but once that was all done, it appears as a new usable drive uh, and, and it pops up. So after that, of course, I wanted to see how fast it was. So I went into some testing. So the first benchmark I tried was the Atto Disk Benchmark, uh, and that basically tests a bunch of different transfer sizes, uh, and it will get faster as it tests larger transfer sizes. And I was also running Task Manager so I could see uh, the actual read and write speeds as uh, recorded by Windows. So you can see the results getting faster and faster. On the write speed, it topped out at about two gigabytes per second writes, which is very good. Uh, and then for some reason, the reads after it got to the 1024 kilobyte uh, transfer size, uh, just dropped off, but I was actually comparing the, the the write speeds as recorded I'm sorry the read speeds as recorded by Windows though, and they didn't drop off So I think this was actually a weird issue going on with the utility itself uh, Since I wanted a basis for comparison I ran the same test on the Samsung 960 Pro that's installed installed which is a 512 gigabyte drive bear in mind Windows is installed on that drive at the same time So I was very impressed with the performance numbers here as well They're a bit more linear But again, you can see that the writes top out about at about two gigabytes per second and reads here again Stay pretty consistent once you get up to the uh, higher transfer sizes, but it hit about 3.3 gigabytes per second max 
Next up, I ran Crystal Disk Mark, another popular free disk benchmarking utility. And here we can see uh, more correct numbers for my RAID array, at least when it comes to sequential reads. It hit about 4.7 gigabytes per second. Uh, although the rest of the results here, especially if you compare them again to my Samsung 960 Pro results, aren't quite as impressive. And I think this has something to do with the software RAID overhead, as well as the fact that just the 750 SSD out of the box is not as fast as the 960 Pro. The 960 Pro is very expensive, but also very fast. It's pretty much widely regarded as the fastest M.2 NVMe SSD you can get right now. So I was expecting it to be faster than the 750s. Wasn't necessarily expecting it to be faster than the 750s in RAID, but a testament to how fast that Samsung drive is, and also some of the potential overhead uh, slowdown that you get when you're dealing with the software RAID configuration as opposed to a hardware RAID configuration. Who knows? But more to the point, are these drives, either of them, going to be fast enough to handle my 4K capturing? So next step, of course, was to reinstall the capture cards, which I had removed just for the sake of compatibility issues for getting the system initially set up. Uh, with them popped back in. Oh, and by the way, I labeled the in and out on the back in and out. That's very important. I feel like that's something missing from these capture cards. Clearly labeled in and out. Anyway, uh, beyond that, of course, I needed the software. Uh, and Blackmagic actually has a software utility which has two separate programs. One is the Blast Blackmagic Desktop Video Setup Utility, uh, which is very useful just for looking and making sure everything's recognized. It recognized both of my desktop mini recorder and uh, my, I'm sorry, my DeckLink mini monitor and mini, mini recorder cards. And here you can do some basic functions like uh, what kind of video inputs and outputs are being accepted, or you can manually uh, set it to be using the HDMI or the SDI for input or output. Also note that that output one can do 444, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So with the software installed, of course, I had to make sure that the capture was actually working. So the next step was to take my camera, my GH5, use the HDMI 2.0 outs, and connect it to the uh, capture card, the input on the back of here, and of course, just pop the software to see what was working. Now, what I'm gonna be doing in the future is using probably different software to capture because uh, Blackmagic's capture software is called Media Express. It is functional, but when I set it to capture at the native output that the camera is doing, which is 4K, uh, 24 frames per, at least what I was doing is 4K, 24 frames per second, 10 bit color depth, and 422 uh, chroma keying, uh, it ends up capturing a raw signal, which is pretty data intensive. Now I measured the actual write speeds going to the SSDs and it was somewhere in the 550 megabytes second per second to 600 megabytes per second, which is actually not terrible and well within what my uh, NVMe SSDs are capable of, but definitely outside of the range of what you would uh, be able to record or capture at with say a standard SATA connected SSD. It's just a little bit faster than what's needed for that. And the actual data rate that it was writing at when it was recording this raw 4K 10-bit 422 video was about 4.2 gigabyte gigabits per second, which is insane. This software does not do any compression on the fly. Now, when I was recording that, as far as what was being written to the drives, it was actually writing at about 550 to 600 megabytes per second, uh, which is well within what my NVMe SSDs are capable of, which I've already shown. And also, not too far outside of the range of what a typical SSD would be able to handle, but definitely a bit too much. So you definitely need a higher end SSD configuration to capture this type of video. But all that said, the bit rate I was capturing at was just insanely dense. Capturing 4K, 10 bit, 422 video uh, at 24 frames per second, 4.2 gigabits per second means that when I'm capturing this video, I need about 30 gigabytes of space for every one minute of footage that's recorded. And I tweeted this out yesterday as I was sort of realizing uh, the amount of the density of, of the data that was being written to these drives. And I was like, wow, that's that's interesting. And I got quite a few responses. Uh, Dave Dugdale responded to me and, and quite a few other people. Uh, so I wanted to address that really quick. Uh, part of the reason I was excited about this build is because it was kind of going back to the roots of PC building. Like I wasn't caring about looks or anything like that or lighting. I just wanted it to be quiet and powerful. Uh, kind of the same way I'm going about setting up my video capturing system. I want to see what the maximum is that it's capable of. I want to see what the most that it can do and handle before I sort of reel it back into something a bit more reasonable. What I'm capturing right now with the Media Express utility, it's completely raw. What I want to do is capture it with a different software utility that can either uh, encode it on the fly, uh, giving me much, much smaller file sizes, or potentially even capture it with Media Express, 
but then have my system, uh, like have an Adobe Premiere watch folder set up so that when it sees files go into that watch folder, the system automatically re-encodes it, compresses it to a much smaller file size. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to set up something like this is because when you start with raw video, uh, the compression can get you much better results. There is compression that happens on the fly in even something like a camera, like my GH5 can also capture 4K footage at 422, but it records it to, a, I believe, 150 megabit per second file, which is totally fine and totally good. But there is something to be said for the potential for capturing that footage elsewhere and then using something like this, which is much more powerful to encode it. And I might even potentially be able to get uh, better video quality, sharpness, color reproduction. But of course, all that remains to be seen because you got to kind of test that to see what the benefit of it is. Like I said, if most of you guys at home are watching on 8-bit panels, then you're not going to really appreciate the color depth that you get with a 10-bit video signal. Um, that said, YouTube also does compression. There's lots of other things to consider. But all of that said, I'm pretty excited that the system is up and running. I'm excited that my uh, RAID array is, con is configured properly. I'm excited that this is super quiet. Really, really quiet. I can barely hear it. Uh, and I'm also excited that I'm about to leave for Computex. And that is why I need to cut this video off before I go any further. When I get back, I will be hitting this up again. I have not yet replaced it. I haven't moved it over here to, to set it up to use full time. There's more capture devices I want to set up. I need to do some live streaming uh, testing. And of course, I'm very curious uh, to what you guys at home think of this system and how I'm going about using it because I think there might be some experts out there who have gone a bit further down the path than I have. I would really, really love to hear your feedback. Any comments that you might have in the comment section, greatly appreciated. If you are interested in something similar to this, if you want to do gaming and live stream or something like that too, please also leave your uh, comments and feedback with any suggestions of specific testing scenarios that you'd like to see me set this system up for. What I'm probably going to end up doing in a, with it in the future is have a completely separate gaming computer that I can play games at 4K at, capture on this system so it's not affecting the performance on the other system at all, and then I can give you guys very accurate real-time captured footage of gameplay with overlays with, uh, uh, with, with frame rates and, and, and all that good stuff so you guys can get a better idea of how hardware performs. That's really what this is all about. Anyway, I think I've rambled far enough. Uh, I think Kyle's on his way over here right now to do the live show and I still need to pack. So guys, if you're excited about Computex, definitely hit that thumbs up button. Hit the thumbs up button, I guess, if you like the video too. Uh, I'll be back next week with tons and tons of Computex coverage, so stay tuned for that. Hit the subscribe button if you're not already. Thanks so much, as always, for watching, and we'll see you next time.